Negative emission technologies face numerous challenges from technological and economic hurdles to public acceptance concerns, but progress in research, collaboration and regulation provides indications they may yet form part of the future energy mix. In May 2018, Drax Bioenergy Plant in Yorkshire announced a pilot project to incorporate carbon capture and storage technology into its operations. The first project of its kind in Europe to combine bioenergy and CCS or BEX, as biomass grows, CO2 is absorbed from the atmosphere. Through photosynthesis, carbon is incorporated into plant fibres, while oxygen from the decomposed CO2 molecule is set free. When biomass is broken down through combustion or other natural processes, the carbon atoms that the plant was composed of are released. Together with the oxygen of the air, they form CO2. The CO2 molecules then split again through the process of new biomass growth, which is captured in the next generation plant, and so the cycle continues. When applying BEX, the CO2 previously tied up in the biomass is captured from the atmosphere, and the gas flow is diverted into bedrock of permanent storage. In this way, BEX systems create a flow of CO2 out of the atmosphere. The technology behind BEX was first mentioned in scientific publications in the 1990s. In June 2018, Nature Energy reported on the work of Radu Kastirshin and colleagues demonstrating a lab-scale system that employs organic reactants in a two-stage capture process and is energy efficient enough to run off solar power. Such lab-scale studies still need further work to increase efficiency and minimise the energy demands of the processes, but a handful of companies are actively pursuing commercialisation and targeting release in the next few years. For example, a Canadian company, Carbon Engineering, recently provided analysis of a plant that could remove a million tonnes of CO2 per year. The Nature paper discusses process designs and provides a breakdown of capital costs whilst estimating levelised costs between $94 to $200 per tonne of CO2 sucked out of the air. While these numbers are notable in themselves, being rather lower than some of the previous analyses have suggested, more broadly the principle of the company reporting its technology in such details to be applauded. Efforts to facilitate information sharing are also to be encouraged. For example, a recent launch project from the CO2 Storage Data Consortium, CSDC, a mixture of international industrial partners, universities and government agencies, plans to build and operate a platform for sharing data relevant to the storage of carbon. Their aim is to make available well-documented data sets that detail, for example, such things as site geology, geophysical modelling, as well as data from full-scale projects and field tests. While sharing information can help focus efforts to bring down costs, carbon capture will remain a challenging area in which to make headway commercially unless more value can be found within it. Indeed, companies are exploring ways to make entry into the direct air capture industry more attractive through the utilisation of the CO2 they produce. Avenues include the sale of CO2 to greenhouses and conversion of the captured CO2 into transportation fuels. Of course, putting the CO2 to some use beyond simply burying it in the ground complicates the net benefit in terms of atmospheric CO2 levels. Nevertheless, it does pave the way for further development of large-scale technologies, as well as the infrastructure to support them, and that in itself should not be dismissed. Policy also has a role to play in encouraging carbon capture through regulatory frameworks, such as California's Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which provides incentives for fuels to reduce carbon footprints. In the United States, there appears to be a rare bipartisan consensus on supporting CCS, as seen through the passing of additional tax credits for captured carbon as well as funding for CCS research. It is still generally considered that some level of baseload is required for our power systems, and at present most readily available option for this is to use fossil fuel plants. CCS could lower the carbon intensity of these operations, but is unattractive if it only increases operational costs. However, this would change if the fact that CCS enabled fossil fuel plants could provide the necessary inertia to the energy system at reduced carbon intensity where appropriate value applied. Viewing CCS enabled fossil plants as providing a necessary service and rewarding this appropriately could encourage development and build out of CCS infrastructure in a way that could benefit its application in the context of NETS. However, the importance of public acceptance and potential public subsidy of a large-scale energy project such as BEX must not be forgotten when in designing such incentives. For negative emission technologies to deliver the rapid success required for them to make a significant contribution to mitigate CO2 levels, the kind often included in pathways to limit global warming to 2 degrees or less, several advances still need to be made. Yet there is grounds for optimism. In a joint report by Imperial College, 
UK Met Office and Tyndall Centre for Climate Research pointed out, X has the greatest maturity and there are no practical barriers for why its introduction to today's energy system shouldn't be forthcoming.